Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Welcome to today's course on innovations in Microtia Atreza treatment, a 3D hearing ear in one surgery presented by Dr. Cheryl Lewin. In today's course, you'll be able to explain how ear reconstruction has evolved over the past 20 years, be able to explain how 3D technology for Microtia creates a more realistic surgical outcome and be able to distinguish common 3D terminology used. Also, be able to explain how a 3D hearing ear can be completed in one surgery for those born with microtia and atresia. Thank you very much for joining us today. I now turn the presentation over to Dr. Lewin. Hello, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and I wanted to start by thanking Oticon Medical and uh, Audiology Online for allowing me to give this presentation. Let me get my talk up here. All right, I think we're ready to go now. So as Melissa said, we're going to go over innovations in microtia atresia treatment, and I'm going to specifically discuss how we can get a 3D hearing ear in one surgery. So by way of introduction, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. This is probably not the word you were looking to see when I started this talk, but this word is actually very central to how I arrived where I am today. So I started my college years not really sure what I wanted to do, but I discovered architecture and decided that would be my career. So I completed my education in architecture, and then I started to get, have a little bit of second thoughts about this career and actually decided to change gears and go into medicine. However, once I finished my first two years and started clinics, I really, really missed both the art and the creativity of architecture. And so I was sort of perplexed, how am I going to get all of these things together in one career and much by serendipity, it came to be that I discovered I can do surgery to create ears, and it sort of fulfills all of my professional needs. So that's kind of a little bit of the background to how I ended up here. It wasn't really planned, but it's been quite a blessing to me. So Lewin Ear Reconstruction was born. This is my practice. I started it in 2012 after working in hospitals, children's hospitals and other hospitals. And um, we basically just do microtia reconstruction, about 90% of what I do, maybe 95 now. And uh, it's been quite, quite rewarding. So today I want to introduce you to microtia, which in literal terms it means little ear. This is a drawing of one of my favorite patients who, who was missing both ears. And so after he got his first big ear, this was his self-portrait. I always love that. This condition affects about 1 in 6,000 to 12,000 babies. And it seems to prefer boys more than girls, about 60% 60, uh, 60 boys. And also about 60% right side more than left side. It occurs bilaterally about 7 to 22 percent of the time, so much less common. But actually, a, a fair amount of the time, almost half of the time, you can see this condition with other associated anomalies. And the two most common syndromes that we think of with microtia would be OAVS, which is on a very large spectrum, and Treacher-Collins syndrome, also on a spectrum. We do know that the prevalence is significantly higher in Asian, Hispanic, and Native American cultures, although there's theories as to why, but we do not, we do not actually understand why. And this slide, I think, is really important because you don't just have microtia or don't. Microtia is definitely a spectrum from just a small ear to nothing at all, and where you fall on this spectrum really determines from my perspective, a little bit of your outcome and how difficult your case is going to be and things that I need to be thinking about to do you know, the best job possible. So 
um, this is a grading, it, it's a simplistic grading scale of how surgeons discuss microtia atresia when they see it. This is specific to microtia. goes from the most minimal grade one to the extreme grade four where there's nothing. But really about 80% of microtia cases are grade three, probably what you might feel like you've seen most commonly as well, where there's a little bit of an earlobe, a little cartilage nubbin above it, and we call that grade three. So, of course, we all wish we knew the answer to what caused microtia. We get a little closer, we get a little better understanding over time when we find, for instance, genetic syndromes where we can identify the gene relating to it. But honestly, most microtia is seen either isolated or not part of a genetic syndrome, and therefore it is a question that we haven't answered, how much is genetic versus environment. But for those of you that work with any families that have microtia atresia, I feel like this is such an important point. I actually include this slide in every single talk, and often I'm speaking to parents, and this is just so, so universal that it, it really is important to keep in mind that the guilt that parents feel when the baby is born and nobody knew and there's this newborn with a missing ear and or ear canal, it's important to stress to the family that there was nothing that was done during pregnancy that caused this. It really almost doesn't matter how much I say it, I still have crying moms in the audience every time because it just hits home that it's our, our natural instinct to think we did something wrong. but. But it's important to educate everyone that that's not the case. Oral atresia, so when you're missing your ear canal, it can be complete, meaning there's no evidence of a canal at all. Or it can be oral stenosis, which means a smaller canal. But interestingly, the longer I'm in this field, you can get you know very, very unusual canal anatomy. In fact, just this week, we did a case for uh, a patient with microtia atresia, but he had the stenosis with a, a canal very close to his jawline. So you really have to do a whole nother, you know, sort of treatment for that severe. But these would be what's seen most commonly. It's a little less common than microtia, one in 10,000 to 20,000 babies, but it also primarily unilateral, primarily boys and preferentially also right side over left, so similar in those respects. And there's three basic treatment options that we talk, talk about. <clears throat> the bone anchored hearing systems, which we're going to go into more detail a little later. The middle ear implants, which are just starting to come to America and are, are not quite entrenched here. So I'm not going to talk about those because, quite honestly, I don't have enough background knowledge for you know, those specific systems since they're not, um, they're not all here in the U.S. And then atresia repair, which we'll touch upon as well. So I always found it kind of interesting, I guess I love ears, but I found it interesting understanding the evolution of ear reconstruction. So it, it pretty much it was fascinating that the um, initial um, ear reconstruction ideas started an incredibly long time ago. And so how that evolution worked is, is a little odd because it took a very long time to progress where we are today. And maybe one of the reasons it took so long is because it's very well kind of understood and accepted that creating an ear is one of the most challenging operations that we perform. I think that is largely why I sort of fell in love with it because I, I knew we have a long way to go and, and I had hoped in my career, if dedicated to this one procedure, you know, I could make an impact there. So really long time ago, 6th century BCE, was this famous, famous surgical text, and it was called the Sushruta Samhita, and this was literally when the first description of ear surgery occurred, albeit not the form we do today, and certainly simplistic, but it was taking local tissue to create a part of the ear that was missing. And then you jump to the 16th century when Tagliacozzi used tissue that was located behind the ear where we have a little more mobility and in that way could move that tissue around to repair traumatic ear deformities. So a lot of plastic surgery, so he, he was famous for nasal reconstruction as well, 
is moving tissue from one place to another. And we've gotten much better at it today, but, uh, but it's fascinating the principles that they figured out so long ago. So we jump to 1920. The very famous Sir Harold Gillies is considered the father of plastic surgery. And he had a pretty amazing idea to use the rib cartilage from a cadaver as well as rib cartilage from a mom to help reconstruct a baby's ear. So unfortunately, as good an idea as it was, at the time it wasn't understood that the body would react against tissue that it saw as foreign, and therefore all that cartilage was resorbed. But it laid the groundwork for the true father of cartilage ear surgery, excuse me, cartilage ear surgery, which is Dr. Tanzer, and he's really, this is where ear reconstruction began. 1959, very long time ago, he presented a paper of his first several patients, and it took six stages, but he was able to make a rib from a patient's own rib. So he sort of put together that the body was rejecting mom's cartilage, so let's use the patient's cartilage. And this has really been the basis of all future rib-based ear reconstructions. So then the thought came, well, maybe there's something like an implant that could be used to make an ear. And so in 66, and you know, sort of when breast implants, uh, uh, different implants were being thought of, but we weren't really using um, silicone very frequently. We didn't understand it very well, but they made a silicone ear, and it looked great. And here you didn't have to harvest the ribs. So it seemed like such a fantastic idea. However, over time, what happened is most of these extruded, and ultimately, even Dr. Cronin admitted that this was not a viable solution for ear reconstruction. We couldn't make the implant work. So basically, at that point, really everything focused on these rib cartilage ears, and the most famous rib surgeon in America, Bert Brent, this is his framework, and this was essentially the gold standard and what all you know, plastic surgeons in America were learning. And just from the 70s to, say, 2000 or 2010, they were refining this procedure, but it wasn't changing dramatically. They did fewer surgeries and kind of tried to minimize scars and minimize complications and pain. But the basic principle is you take three rib cartilages, so you can see from the chest wall, it's quite a sizable piece because you need to create an adult-sized ear, and this created a safe durable ear reconstruction, you had to carve this shape of a rib into something that looked more like an ear, which is obviously quite more primitive than the, the natural ear, but it was sewn together, these multiple little stacked pieces with stainless steel wire or permanent suture, and that got you this framework. Then I'll go through a little bit of how that framework is used, but Basically, because it's somewhat invasive, it requires inpatient hospitalization. As we said, multiple surgeries. It is somewhat painful, so you can at least get special medications or IV medication or an epidural to help with that pain, and that's a significant improvement. But one big issue is that you have to delay the surgery until the kid is grown large enough that those three ribs can create an adult-sized ear. And so in almost every country, uh, rib surgeons have chosen about 10 years to get that. Some really big kids, maybe you could go younger. In America, there's a little more pressure to do early reconstruction, so they push it down a little, but you have less rib to work with. For all types of ear reconstruction, a lot of experience is required to get consistent results. So a little bit of graphic videos. I apologize. Close your eyes if it bothers you, but simply put, they're going to this video is going to show you a, a colleague of mine in Canada who does these type of ear reconstructions. Her framework is seen here on the left, and she dissects what we call a pocket, so a space where this implant can sit in the proper position to become an ear. And here she is putting that implant into position. She kind of goes in upside down, and she turns it, gets it into position, and then ultimately she will sew this together, put a drain in there, put the drain on suction, and when it's all sewn up, it will look like this at the end of the day. So the skin, the suction allows the skin to basically shrink wrap to the 
rib framework, and then you can see the form of the ear. However, this technique, you have to kind of bury the ear framework under the skin. So it doesn't stick out at all, and that's why you need multiple surgeries. The next one or two surgeries will address projecting the ear out. So these are the probably four most famous rib cartilage surgeons in the world from multiple different countries. And you can see that the frameworks are all a little bit different and a little, you know, everybody has their somewhat unique reconstruction technique. But all of them, because they have to withstand the pressure of that skin compressing it, they're quite thick. And if you're looking at a natural ear, the cartilage of a natural ear, you can see it's extremely thin, delicate, and three-dimensional, and and very curvy, like so a very thin, curvy uh, structure, these cannot mimic that because they would basically collapse under the skin. So they have to be sturdy, thicker, and stronger. And clearly that will affect the outcome. So when all these were put in their skin pockets, these are the same frameworks for these ears. This is what you see as the result of those um, reconstructions. And they all look ear-like for sure, but they also do not have the three-dimensionality or delicacy of a natural ear. So this is something that I noticed and in my early years when I did rib cartilage, it was a source of frustration that you can't, you know, it doesn't look like exactly like the other side. One of the biggest issues is that even after the surgery to project the ear out, it doesn't always work and the rib ears tend to fall backwards. And so this girl had a rib ear that required, you know, removal and replacement with a new ear reconstruction. You can see with her other ear normal, it's quite obvious that they're not symmetric. This boy had a similar issue, but his surgeon decided, I'll just pin back the other ear. But to not see any ears, when you look at someone face on, is a very unnatural appearance. So that's another significant issue that, you know, is not acceptable in my opinion. Finally, there are many surgeons out there making rib ears that really should never be touching patients with microtia atresia. I, along with almost all microtia surgeons, people dedicated to this condition, feel extremely strongly that you cannot allow someone with little experience to do this procedure. It is incredibly challenging even for those of us that do it every day it's certainly not something that an occasional uh, surgeon who just learned it and has done a few should be operating and these are the results so very much worse than the condition itself so I'm a I'm a big proponent of if you can't make it to a very very experienced surgeon who you see their results then you just hold off on surgery so my conclusion is that the rib cartilage technique cannot mimic how delicate and three-dimensional a natural ear is. Which takes me to porous implant ear reconstruction. I call it PEER just as a short term, um, but to tell you a little bit about how this implant came to be, the actual material is a high-density porous polyethylene that was actually developed initially in the 70s but it wasn't really used clinically until the 80s. And so we it, it's an incredibly light material because it's made up of these pieces of the of the polyethylene with holes in between. Those are the pores and because that it, it's about 50% air so it's very lightweight yet very strong. And one of the most important things is that of all the types of implants out there like uh, titanium or silicone this type of porous polyethylene tends to be the least reactive material you can place in a body surgically. And that's an FDA decided, you know, fact basically. So it's because instead of the body seeing this implant as a foreign body, it accepts the implant and grows into the pores. And it's pretty fascinating. So as one might imagine, when we discovered this, we found all kinds of indications for its use, which are still in use today, as you can see, all over the craniofacial skull and um, face. 
and you know extensive number of surgeries over many many years have proven the safety of it certainly not as long as a rib cartilage ear but um, in 1982 this was the very first ear reconstruction made using porous polyethylene dr alexander berghaus uh, lent me these pictures of his very first patient uh, the first one ever to receive this technology done in germany well, by the mid-90s, a company called Medpore created this two-piece Medpore implant made of this porous polyethylene, and it is not terribly different than what you would buy today. There's been very little modification. It comes as a rim and a base. And here you can see in this video, you can size the rim to be bigger or smaller because it's in two pieces. And then once you decide your size, you use heat to melt the two pieces together. And then you add a little more so you get strength. But interestingly, it's the fact that it's two pieces um, ha is significant when I started analyzing the results of these ear reconstructions. So here you can see a completed ear that I was using up until 2017. So I used these two pieces and that was fantastic about them is their structure allowed the tissue to grow into the implant. So much so that if you, not that you would do this, but if you cut this implant in half, once it was implanted in the body, the actual implant would bleed because the vessels and tissue grows into it. So in this the positives where it could be very thin but very very strong that it was biocompatible and in 2015 a new company besides medpor started creating it supor so i switched to supor that's why we call it peer because there's multiple companies that make these and the one thing to note is even though it looks more realistic than rib it is still not flexible it's very very hard and for it to survive well in a body over your lifetime, it has to be covered 100% with your body's own tissue. So very briefly, I'll show you kind of how we get that tissue to cover this implant, which is sort of the magic that makes everything work. So this is a little three-year-old boy. So he's got a three-year-old sized ear. So first we have to envision what his adult sized ear would be and then take the opposite shape and position it symmetrically where we imagine his adult ear will go. You see um, that we have all these dots and dashes drawn on this little guy's scalp. Those represent arteries, the dots, and veins, the dashes. So I sort of map out the blood vessel supply to the head here, and I figure out the best tissue. I make an incision right here behind the ear. This is the only incision used. We don't make any incisions in the scalp, something that I started doing um, shortly after fellowship finished in 2006. Then I decide, where do I want to get the tissue that's going to cover this implant? We call this tissue a fascial flap. And it's literally a reddish pink color because of all these blood vessels. So it's pulsing and alive. And the way that we are able to make this work is we keep this purple spot, which is the blood supply to the flap, intact. We don't touch that area because that's where all the blood vessels are coming from. But we come all the way around from underneath the scalp through that white incision. We go all the way underneath, lift this up, come around, and then we literally can pull it out from under the head and, and it just sits outside the body now still connected by that purple area. So I'm going to show you what this actually looks like, and I'll try to warn you right before it occurs. <laughs> um, but one thing I really want you to remember is sort of the magic of this surgery has to do with how this flap is dissected. It's really what is critical for um, minimizing any future complications. It has to really be dissected perfectly. So after we get the implant made, the flap dissected, then we have to cover it with skin. And so I find that it's best to cover the back of the ear with skin from either your tummy or your upper inner arm because you can get a nice piece with a thin scar. And then the front of the ear, we use skin from around the microtia and skin from the back of the opposite ear, which doesn't change its 
projection, but we can, you know, sneak a little skinny piece from there. And those two together combine to cover the front of the ear so that the new ear is the proper color. So here's the part if you're if you're um, nervous to see what the flap looks like, you can close your eyes for this part. But here's the, the implant in place, and then this is what the flap looks like over it. So now we've completed covering the implant with the flap, and we're now at the point where we're gonna put suction with this drain on. And so when we do that, you'll notice that the ear will gain a little more definition. And it takes the form of the implant. So after that, we're going to put skin on. You can see these meticulous suturing to put these skin grafts just right. And you'll see that we're able to use that skinny piece from behind the other ear and then from the, around the, where the microtia was. That's our ear skin so that our ear has a proper color. If we didn't have quite enough, then we use the skin in the bowl and around the back of the ear. And that's from the arm or the tummy, depending on the child. And then you can see, even though they're from different areas, even at seven weeks post-op, we still start to see kind of nice blending. There's a lot more healing to do, obviously. This is a very early result, but the skin colors tend to blend okay. So to summarize the difference between these two techniques, peer and rib cartilage, peer can be done as an outpatient because it's not very painful, and therefore the kids wake up after surgery um, doing quite well. They just take uh, over-the-counter medication for pain. Unfortunately for rib cartilage, that harvest of the rib is painful. The peer can be done in one stage. On occasion, we need to do a small revision. Um, rib cartilage is multiple stages, minimum of two, but more commonly three or four. We talked about the difference in pain and the difference in age. So I used to do peer at three years, but because we are um, wanting to get slightly larger flaps and, and be mindful of anesthesia in under four-year-olds, I have made it now four years is my earliest age, and then rib cartilage much longer. So why, why is that early time so important? I, I have sort of always believed that there's a much more significant psychological component to this condition even in these young kids, but I, I didn't understand just how big that component was, or I certainly was um, persuaded to think harder about it when I treated this little patient. This is Trey. Uh, again, he was only three years old, and he came to the OR with Bunny Bear, his best friend, and you know, you may notice, or I will help you notice, that there is this similarity with Trey and his bear in that both have a little bit different looking left ear. And I thought, oh, I'm sure that's a coincidence. I kind of mentioned to the mom, like, I thought that was sort of funny, and she's like, oh, no, that is no coincidence. And I had a little kid about Trey's age, and I'm like, my kid definitely doesn't know his right from his left or anything about it, doesn't pay attention to anything. And I thought, you know, I really doubt that um, there's any significant thing going on. He just happens to nibble on the on this bear's ear. But then the mom sent me this picture, and I was kind of blown away, because it is just hard to think that that is all simply coincidental. So the funniest part was we went on to give him his big ear, and then his two ears looked the same, so he gnawed all the other ears, the right-sided ears, so that the ears were now symmetric on all of his bears. It was pretty cute. But anyways, I just take a moment to say that there's a lot more going on in these little kids' minds about this stuff that we adults probably don't understand. And it's not a problem to, to do an ear at four because if you look at this graph of how ears grow over time, they're already 83% grown at four years of age and 90% by seven years. So I feel like certainly there's less anxiety and the little kids seem to experience less pain and not have, um, they bounce back from surgery quite quickly, say, compared to a teenager. And that would lead them to have an earlier increase in self-confidence and less of a memory of the whole process if they can have their ear done before kindergarten. And hopefully, one would imagine that would also be um, less teasing and bullying, because 
at least with two ears, although they may not be exactly the same, it is a little less noticeable than a completely missing ear. So a post-op result of this two-piece uh, type of peer technique is this little girl who was three. So you can see her right ear had the microtia. And when we reconstructed, her right ear looks bigger, which is what we want for it to be a little bigger because she'll grow into it. This view is the best view to check symmetry because you can see that they both project uh, very similar and they're in very similar position. And when you look at her from this side, the ear itself looks like a pretty natural ear. The scars aren't too obvious. And then when you compare her, she, she looks quite similar. Um, and that, I believe, is because her natural ear, which is on the right side of the screen, but it's her left ear, the natural ear is what I would call a very typical ear. So like kind of the common or ideal ear, if you, if you can say there is one. It's just got very standard anatomy from the surgeon's perspective. However, that's not everybody. And I started to appreciate that like eyes and noses, yeah, they're all basically the same, but really they all have their own personality. It's kind of what makes each of us an individual we can identify. And even ears have their own personality. These are all adult ears, adult-sized ears. And yet, look how different their shapes are. So then, with this child I want to show you, also the same way as the last little girl, we did a two-piece peer reconstruction. However, if you look at his ear anatomy, it's a little bit different than this example one that's kind of like, she's an ear model. I got her off Google images for ears. I mean, she has like very classic ear anatomy and the little boy's ear, the bowl's different, the top of the ear is different, the shape of the rim is different. So I tried to reconstruct him as best I could with this technique, but it does sort of point out when you look at him from the front, he's got a very curvy natural ear on the image on the right, it's the right side of the right image, but the reconstructed ear is not, not quite as curvy. It looks in not quite the same projection. Now, if you just look at the single ear, he has a nice reconstruction, I believe, and, um, and it looks very ear-like. However, when you compare the two, that's when at least to my eye, which I believe as a surgeon, you should have a very critical eye. i very happy with his ear reconstruction, but it doesn't look exactly like his other ear because these two piece, they're kind of made to look like an ideal ear, like the last little girl. So when you have ears that are a little different, I'm challenged in a way that that type of an implant was too limiting. So. I'm going to show you why I think so. We get a close-up view. It'll be a little easier to see. This bowl, what we call the conchal bowl of the ear, is not the same shape as the natural conchal bowl. And that sort of bothered me because, you know, in my world, I'd like them to be as symmetric as possible. And more than that, the rim for all these peer ears, all these two pieces, they're very, look like a machine made them. They're very, very kind of standard and all the same and almost so-called too perfect. But natural ears are never that perfect. They get wider, thinner, they bend a lot. So that's why this kid's ear looked a little bit different. It was bendy. So I got to thinking, you know, if everybody's ears are unique, it would be so great if we could make an ear reconstruction exactly by replicating a patient's natural ear, if they're unilateral, obviously. So when I looked at a natural ear compared to the two techniques available up till this time, I really decided I would push hard to see how can we do better than this. And in 2018, I was able to develop what I call a 3D Lewin ear implant and we got to the place where we could create an implant that it essentially was a, well, in this case, an actual image, but it would be a mirror image of the patient's ear. This was actually my employee, our first test patient. <laughs> so it was just to see what we could get. But 
what really happened was this great breakthrough when I found this wonderful scanner that allows me to very simply in two minutes take a little tiny kiddo four years old here and create an actual image of her ear that is a, a essentially perfect match. So this is what that 3D scanner gives me this um, view from every possible angle of all the intricacies of your ear, which is so much more complex than sort of what I had thought. It, until you start seeing these um, scans and models, it's very hard to appreciate that they're actually, I consider them each like a little miniature sculpture. So here's how that very first implant matched the patient's ear. And you can see it really doesn't matter what angle, we were finally able to get a very similar likeness. So basically from that point on, I stopped using this style that is basically what the rest of the world is using. And I just, because it, it's the exact same material, I was free to use these new implants. This company, this wonderful company, Peripherous, makes these ears. It's called Supor, the material, but it is the same porous polyethylene as Medpor. But these are the guys that have um, that I worked with for several years to get to this technology um, and bring it to my patients. I was the first surgeon to offer this ear implant as by routine. Now, more than I'd say. About 95% of my patients are getting either the 3D Lewin ear implants or the kind of 3D ideal ear implant that I use if you're bilateral. So almost everybody. This one-piece implant is created much stronger and much more stable than the two-piece implant. And it does create this perfect match much better than any, you know, I don't know how good a sculptor you could be, but nobody can do as good as this little scanner that is, you know, to a ridiculously incredible accuracy. We talked about bilateral patients. They get a 3D ear of a kind of an ideal ear scan that we did actually on the sibling of one of our patients. And over this past year, we've done 70 of these 3Ds. We have, I think, close to 100 already on the books for next year. The 3D scanning versus 3D printing. This is very um, a constant challenge in understanding the differences between these. So I do want to spend just a moment describing the differences. So scanning has to do with the imagery. So it's the process of visually capturing a three-dimensional object. And this, this is the scanner I use. It's incredibly good. It uses just basically all those little black circles are cameras. And so you're taking all these images and the computer software is creating the building this three-dimensional object. 3D printing is completely different. So that is the actual building of a particular physical object and it's using three-dimensional input and usually it's that input in by probably software tells the 3D printer how to lay down layer after layer after layer to build an actual object. So many labs are trying to 3D print a cartilage ear. And I'm not sure, but some I believe are trying to print even a porous polyethylene ear. Neither of those is what I'm doing because I'm just using the scanning capability and we are creating a sterile uh, porous polyethylene ear from that scan, but not printing it. It's done in a kind of more of a mold type fashion. So we're not quite there yet. I don't know when we will be there for children. Uh, the first clinical studies haven't even been done on adults yet. So it will be some number of years before this is both doable, provable, sustainable, and then practical, meaning you know, is it is it affordable to do as a common, you know, frontline treatment for microtia? So when we compare the 3D versus the MedPor, we talked about these two piece implants. They they can fracture because they had to be soldered together with heat. So there's an inherent weakness in the places where they are connected to the 
ear. And so the ear itself, when it fractures, can appear like this. And if you dissect out the um, if you dissect out the implant, you can see that it's fractured. We can repair it with a 3D ear. But this was a critical problem to solve because you have to do surgery to replace the implant. This is just showing you, this is a, actually a 3D printed model of a kid's natural ear. And basically, this video just shows that once we design this sterile implant for his microtia, how it heals over time. So first week, that's what they're supposed to look like, kind of crazy. And then by a month, it starts to get a little better. But it really takes about a year to fully heal. But you'll see this child through about three and a half months after surgery. And at that point, it starts to look like an ear. So here he is before and after. Before and after. And again, you can see his scars. You can see some redness. Um, because he's so early, but we've basically been able to create a much more realistic looking ear by using this technology. It's slightly bigger than his other ear because of his age. I think he's about five or six. And this just shows three-dimensionally we even can create the back of an ear with this technology. So here's another little girl about four months out. She also got a 3D ear. This is actually the little one that I was scanning. And here you can see her ear reconstruction. And another example of an older boy, more of a teenager. They have thicker flaps, and he's not quite done healing. He's about four months after. So his level of detail isn't quite there. But you can see, you know, pretty symmetric, both front view and back view, which is great if you're a boy and you wear your hair very short. So there are risks associated with peer fracture. We talked about uh, exposure, which is a hole, infection. There can be some injury to nerve to the eyebrow, very, very rare. And then failure, meaning that the flap does not work. So fracture, we talked about. These are just some examples. But I have not seen, we've been doing these one piece ears since 2017, the 3Ds since 2018, and none of them have fractured yet. Exposure as a whole, here you can see a little tiny bit of the implant is exposed. We do have to take the patient to surgery usually to fix that hole, but then often they heal and they still do quite well. But um, the they used to require surgery, but more recently, we've had a really great experience using just a topical medicine to help these. Moving on to infection, you can see this very red, irritated ear 10 days after surgery. But then after just a week of medicine, the infection resolves. And that's because the tissue's grown into the implant. And so the medicine goes into the tissue, into the implant, and allows for treatment. So these are my complications um, from about the 2013 to 2018, over six years. And you can see once we, the first column is all my ear reconstructions, which is 395, versus just the luminary implants, the one pieces. And the most important thing to call attention to is the exposures are significantly lower and the fractures are zero. The rest are pretty similar. So. Now I'm going to switch gears and talk about oral atresia. And we're going to start with talking about the bone anchored hearing system, BAS, or often called BAHA. We'll use those, um, that term BAS. So it converts the sound into vibrations. That's the driving force that pushes you know, from the sound waves from the processor to the implant to the bone to the cochlea that allows it to bypass the canal and middle ear, which are affected in atresia. This BAHA or BAS creates excellent sound conduction and gets better sound localization for these patients. The two that I use um, surgically that I implant when we do ear reconstruction are the cochlear BAHA and Oticon Medical Pontos. And in order to do it in a single stage, uh, we need bone that's adequately thick, which is usually at about five years of age, and we like it to be greater than or equal to three millimeters. And then the abutment, 
is sized based on how big the child is and their thickness of soft tissue. So if you do it at five, you're going to need to change not the implant but the abutment out, you know, many years later when the kid's grown. Then a two stage is if you have bone that's either too thin or too soft, which basically means it's less than three millimeters, and you just put the implant, then you put a little cover on this implant, like a little screw cover, and then you leave it under the scalp, you can't see it at all, and you wait three to six months, and then under local anesthesia you can put the abutment on when the osseointegration process has taken care of itself. But I think it's underestimated how important positioning is. And it's very challenging if you don't have an ear for a surgeon who's not doing the ear reconstruction to know where to put it. So I really don't like Bajas or Baws being done prior to ear reconstruction. For this kid, we did it at the same time. And you can see we placed our implant here. We put a sleeper, which is basically something that if the first implant for some reason got knocked loose, we could use the sleeper. That's kind of like the way a second stage is done, a two-stager is done. And we position it based on the location of his ideal canal, which you can feel when you're in surgery, and that's about 50 to 55 millimeters away and uh, in line with the top of the ear. So that's how our positioning works. I do this type of um, surgery with no additional scarring. So you can see that we have an implant and a sleeper because we, we were doing a two-stage for him and he does not have any scars. So th those are not without the risks either, but they're very minor risks that I rarely see. But you can have bleeding, infection, healing issues are more common um, in certain, particularly years ago, I find it less common these days. A CSF leak is if you're drilling for the bone and you have a tiny little tear in the covering over the brain, you get cerebrospinal fluid leak. I think I've seen it only once ever, and it's very easily fixed by putting the implant in place. And then poor osseointegration. So I do want to spend a couple minutes on atresia repair surgery as well. Um, and it's important that Really only 50% of kids that have oral atresia are considered good candidates for surgery. There's sort of a very complex um, way to assess how good a candidate you are, and it involves getting a CT scan and looking at the audiogram and uh, the anatomy from the outside and then making that decision. This is an example of a kid who had an atresia repair, and this is right before I did his, you know, before he had it, and then before I did his ear reconstruction. So. My one thing that I feel like is, is important to educate people about, be it parents or audiologists or whomever, is that this surgery I find to be not very predictable. And even if you have the best surgeon in the world who did the best surgery, the improvement in hearing is not predictable. And we haven't got long-term data to prove that the hearing that you gain early on will last. It's important to know that there's lifelong care to clean this canal. So once you go down this road, you really can't go back. I came to know at a, an international conference that much of the world has actually abandoned this surgery, but still there are a few spots that still do atresia repair, and the U.S. is one of those spots. Um, we also are um, one of the countries that doesn't have the latest technology as well. One of the reasons I um, have concerns is that two patients in the past year that I did reconstruction on a long, long time ago that was successful um, lost their ear due to complications from the canal. So to me, that just added another level of importance in this decision-making process for a family. So here's an example of a normal ear versus atresia um, repair. This is a kid that I did with a one-piece implant. And although I'm very happy with his ear reconstruction, I put the slide in to see that aesthetically, there's really nothing you can do to remove the dark black hole of the canal reconstruction because that needs to be out there available for aeration in order to function. So it does affect, you know, if you put your finger over that in your <laughs> vision, it, it looks much more like an ear, but that big black hole certainly is a big signal that this is not a natural ear. 
And then there's a lot of risks to atresia repair, and many of them require surgery, but the ears can get smaller, they can get keloids, you can have a facial nerve paralysis or facial nerve injury um, if, you, if you're not an experienced surgeon specializing in this. And then the issue of hearing loss over time is pretty significant as well. So the way I kind of look at this in order of trying to figure out how to compare these options. The atresia repair is more of a high risk with an unpredictable reward. But there's a big upside because you don't have to have a visible device and it's particularly significant if you are missing both canals. The downside, however, is hearing gain may be minimal or it may be temporary. You may still require a boss and you may have a poor aesthetic out, uh, appearance. Whereas the bone anchored hearing system is a very low risk, it's high reward because it's very frequently will get you so-called normal hearing, at least by audiogram. It's quite a minor surgery, so very little risk. And the processors are getting better and smaller and less noticeable, which is fantastic. So thank you, all of you. I know Otakon, I believe, has the smallest out there right now with their new Ponto 4. So all that Technology is great and helpful, but it is still a visible device and you can still have issues with infections over time. So all of this got us to where I am today. This is a fairly recent patient of mine who did come get a 3D porous implant ear reconstruction and we happened to do a magnet Baja 5 for him with no scars in the scalp. So from where I started when I finished fellowship in 2005 to where we are today, um, I don't think we're there yet. I don't think I'm done, but I think um, I'm very happy with the direction we're moving towards advancing the treatment of this condition. Here's a little boy, it's very similar, no scalp scars, and he has the Ponto. Last thing I wanted to say um, has to do with our mission to educate families and audiologists about microtia and atresia. So every other year, usually, we have conferences and bring together surgeons, um, ENT surgeons, and rib cartilage surgeons, and myself, and we have uh, conferences to teach everybody about all the specifics of this in much greater detail. So. Audiologists are welcome to join us and um, please look us up on our website and we can get you more information to join us in August for our next conference in Los Angeles. Last little bit for the talk. Please um, watch this little guy who's one of my favorite reactions to seeing his ear for the first time. I have two big ears. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> Thank you guys very much for your attention. I really appreciate that. Hopefully I'm still here. Okay, at this time, if there are any questions, please go ahead and send those in. I'm going to go ahead and copy them for you, Dr. Lewin, right now. Okay. I'm not sure I'm in the right screen. Go ahead and look in the lower right-hand corner in our presenter chat, and you'll see the questions there. I'm going to copy them for you. How do I get out of the lobby? Uh, it's okay. That's where you want to be. Look underneath the attendee list. No, it's just gray. In the it's box. Gray. Oh. All right. Hold on. Maybe you could just say them to me. Is that okay? Oops. All right. Do you see that question there for you? No. I do not. Okay. Families want to know if you'll ever do the middle ear implant surgeries. 
Oh, I do not do the middle ear implant because that's really done by an otologist that specializes in that anatomy. So middle ear implants, um, like a vibrant sound bridge by Medell, those I have patients that have done them and it's done after the ear is reconstructed because if it's done first, it destroys the tissue I need for the ear reconstruction. Excellent. Thank you. That is um, okay. Another question. Do you perform the combined microtia atresia surgery? Um, I used to do that when it first came out. I believe 2007 was the first one, and I was present for that surgery. But um, I did it after doing it for several years. It became apparent that the results were better when uh, the surgeries were done separately. So my preference is to do the atresia repair first and then three to four months later come and get the ear reconstructed. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Any, if anyone has any other questions, go ahead and write those in. Dr. Lewin, thank you very much for this course today. It was wonderful. Absolutely fantastic. Um, thank you so, so much. So much information in here today. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you to Audiology Online especially, and also thank you to Oticon Medical. I really appreciate it.